Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Brian, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide a smooth recording. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our upcoming webinars are on the 18th, that's Wednesday next week, two steps forward, one step back. Is this genealogy or the cha-cha with Sarah Cochran? And that'll be Wednesday at 4 p.m. And we also have on that Friday as well next week, Utah Digital Newspapers with Jeremy Min Minty um, on Friday at 4 p.m. If you'd like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to the recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Catherine Grant, who will be presenting on When One Record Isn't Enough, Building a Complete Picture with Multiple Records. After years on the sidelines, Catherine began doing family history and discovered that she loved it. Her specialty is helping new family historians find success and maybe even avoid some of the mistakes she's made. Catherine teaches Sunday classes at the BYU Family History Library. She also presents at Riverton, Utah, Saturday seminars and other family history events. Her column on family history ran in the Nauvoo Times for about a year and is still available online. In addition, she is a regular contributor to the Family Search blog. Catherine works as a technical writer and instructional designer with a focus on usability and process improvement. Besides family history, she loves, up, loves uplifting music, thought-provoking books, and springtime. Um, if Catherine is ready, then we'll turn the time over to her. Yes, the webinar here. And I think we're good to go. So everybody, thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar. Uh, this is an exciting time we're living in, isn't it? And it's so wonderful that we can still keep doing these webinars. So let's take a quick look at what we're going to be covering in today's webinar. It's a pretty exciting one. First of all, we're going to talk about why one record is rarely enough. And then we will have an example. I've named it Martin's Dash, and that is an allusion to the wonderful poem by Linda Ellis that talks about how our life is, if you look maybe at a tombstone, our life is really not contained in the first date or the last date, but it's really contained in that dash between the dates. Then we'll have another example. We will search for Annie Maud's maiden name using multiple records. And then finally, we'll talk about how to know what records to check. So why would one record rarely be enough? When I first started doing family history, I honestly had no clue that one record might not be enough. And I might base a whole family, for instance, on the 1880 census. And then the more I got into it, I discovered a number of reasons why I probably shouldn't just rely on one record. So let's look at some of those reasons. First of all, records are usually for a single event, one event, such as a birth or a marriage or a death, but they don't contain other information. So here's a couple of examples. A birth and marriage record, those types of records rarely contain death information. I have seen like you have possibly birth records that do contain death information if the child was stillborn or died immediately. But it's, and I've never seen a marriage record <laughs> with any death information. So normally, certain types of historical records will just be focused on one event and they won't give us any information on other events from the person's life or just very few. So for instance, a marriage record might give us an age which would give us an approximate birth year. But again, oftentimes, well, depending on the country and so forth, but some records may not have much information on other events of a person's life. Another example in England is burial records. If you look at an English burial record in the 1800s, most likely you're going to see just the person's name, possibly their residence, and then their age. 
I've seen parents once in a while for children that die young, but most of the time in the 1800s, the parents were not listed. So those are just two examples of how a certain type of record really is focused on that one event and doesn't contain a lot of information about other events in the person's life. One record by itself really only forms part of the picture. So what are some other reasons that one record might not be enough? Well, as you've probably all seen, records may be inaccurate or inconsistent, and there's a number of reasons for those for those explanations. First of all, recorders, the people writing things down, whether it's a clergyman or a, a census enumerator, they may misunderstand. They might hear incorrectly. My uh, great-grandmother's name, her first name is Henrietta, but she came over to Utah from England and had a very strong English accent. And so the census enumer enumerator wrote down Anarata because that's what he heard. But her name was definitely Henrietta. So they may hear incorrectly. They may use variant spellings. So many of my ancestors couldn't read or write, so they couldn't tell the person how to spell their name. So the recorder just did the best that they could. Another thing that happens sometimes is that people may misrepresent information intentionally. And probably two of the most common places that I see information misrepresented, uh, men will lie on military records because they either want to get into a war and they're not old enough or not, you know, don't meet the, the physical requirements or whatever, or they might want to get out of a war so they also lie on their military records. And I don't want to misrepresent that. I don't think that type of misre misrepresentation is that frequent, but it does happen. A place where women lie is on censuses. They somehow don't age 10 years between a lot of censuses. And so you've got misrepresented information that you're dealing with where it's intentional, but sometimes people just plain make mistakes. We're human, right? And so someone may ask us a question and we, you know, we're distracted and we rattle off an answer and then later we realize, oh my goodness, I, I told them the wrong thing. So there are a number of reasons why one record isn't enough because we find these variations from record to record. And in order to build a complete picture, it's usually best to rely on as many records as we can find for the person. And by that, I don't mean to uh, present it in a discouraging light, saying that you need to find absolutely every record that ever existed for that person. That's not what I'm wanting to say at all. But on the other hand, it's so easy nowadays to get access to digital records. With the click of a button, we can come up with maybe you know, three, five, ten or more records about a person's life. And that kind of research where it's so easy, there's, there's no reason not to do it. So when is one record not enough? I would say that it's not enough most of the time. About the only time that it is, quote, enough is when you don't have any other choice. And that does happen. Sometimes you might be researching in a country or a time period where you're lucky to get one record. And so if that's all you've got, then that's wonderful. And we've got to make the best of what we can get. But if it's really easy to find multiple records, then why not find them and use them to make our records more complete? Okay, let's look at our first example, which is Martin's Dash. I'd like to introduce you to Martin Henry Kinnersley. You can see this record from Family Tree that Martin was born on the 1st of May, 1885. He was christened at the last day of the same month in St. Swithin's Lincoln in England, and his parents, according to Family Tree, are Albert Henry Kinnersley and Sarah Gunthorpe Brodell. Martin has one source on his family tree record. Well, actually, he has three, but they're all the same one. You've probably seen those before. So he's got three christening records that are all exactly for the same christening. So you see here, this record, this source that is attached for him, 
validates the information that we saw in his family tree record. The christening date is the same. The parents are basically the same. Sarah's um, spelling is a little bit different and her married name is used instead of her maiden name of Brodell. But this, this gives a pretty good um, coverage of his birth information and his parents. It's the one source that is attached. But is it a complete record? I'd like to introduce you to Martin's family. On the left, you see Martin's family in the 1891 census. On the right, you see the same family in the 1901. What do you notice about Martin in these censuses? And I wish we were in a classroom, but since we're not, and I don't have the chat up, and, and uh, viewers who are, wa or who are watching this live, you're very welcome, as Bryant said, to chat back and forth and share your thoughts and ideas. But the thing that you're prob probably noticing about these two censuses is that Martin is conspicuously absent. He's simply not there with his family. Now, there could be a couple of reasons for that. I have seen cases where a child has gone to live with a grandparent or with an aunt or uncle, something like that. So that is a possibility. But it's also possible that he died as a child. You know, from looking at these census records is we don't have the complete picture. And so we need to do a little bit more looking. So I go to Ancestry and look for Martin Kindersley and look what comes up right away. We've got uh, two christening records. The, the name is slightly misindexed, but Kindersley is such a unique name and the date matches exactly, the place matches exactly. So I'm feeling comfortable that these two christening records are for our Martin. We've also got a civil registration of birth for the same person, and all the information is lining up, the full name, the uh, time of registration in the, what should actually be the June quarter of 1885. Uh, it, the quarters, as you probably know, are, uh, they go by the last uh, month, it, the general register site, the site where civil registration is, is kept. Uh, the quarters go January, February, March, but March, it's called the March quarter, then April, May, June, and it's called the June quarter. So this actually would cover May. Uh, they, I don't know why Ancestry chooses the first month of the quarter, but that's not the way that it's referenced uh, in, the, in the English records. So anyway, this, I just wanted to point that out, that just because it says April, you might look and say, oh, that can't be right, because he wasn't born until May. But that's why this is right, is because this actually represents the quarter from April, May, and, or April, May, and to June. Okay, so what do you see at the bottom of these search results? And there were actually only these four results that pertain to Martin. Well, we see that he's got a civil death registration, and it's in the same place, and it's got the same name. So right now, we've got a pretty good working theory that Martin probably died when he was about a year old, probably died in about 1886. But again, this isn't conclusive proof, so we do want to dig a little bit deeper and make sure that we can validate our theory that Martin really did die in 1886. So these were the only records that Ancestry had, but when I went out to another of my favorite sites for English research, which is Find My Past, I found this burial record. And you notice up here we've got the exact right name, and we've got a death age of 11 months, which fits perfectly with the birth date of May, 1st of May, 1885. In fact, if you look down here a little bit, I hope I don't start crying, but this little boy died the day before his first birthday. And I can't even imagine what that was like for his family. So it's looking now more and more likely that this is our Martin. And there's one final piece of information that kind of clinches it, and that is the residence. And you remember that he was christened in St. Swithin. And on this burial record, it gives the residence as Newton Street. Well, that agrees with the 1881 census. I've got a little screenshot here of the family, and it does give it as Newton. So we're comfortable now that this burial record really is for Martin. 
So a more complete record for Martin looks like this. We not only have the birth and christening information, but we have the death and burial information. And we want to be sure that it's supported by sources. So here are the three christening records that I mentioned that are all for the same christening. And then because of that information I found in civil registration and in the Lincolnshire burials, those two items have been added by sources, uh, added to the sources. And so now we're comfortable that we've got a complete picture of Martin's life. We've got that um, information on the dash, if you will. Okay, let's go on to our second example, which is Annie Maud's maiden name. We're going to start out this example by looking at the 1911 English census for Annie Maud and her family. Because this handwriting is a little bit hard to read, we'll go ahead and look at a typewritten transcript. And also, the whole thing wouldn't fit on the screen, so you notice I've got birthplaces in the transcript, whereas they're not showing in the screenshot. But we've got, first of all, Annie's husband, William Gordon Groves, who was born in Heaton, Northumberland. Then we've got Annie, and then we've got their daughter, Mary. Now, there are a couple of um, oddities on the record, or things maybe that we need to be aware of. The first thing is that in this column in the census, people were supposed to say how long the current marriage had lasted. I don't know about you, but to me, this looks like they wrote one year, but then they crossed it out. And maybe this thing right here was supposed to be a number one. I, I'm not sure, but the best theory that we have right now is probably in 1911, they were married about a year, which means they were married in 1910. The other thing that is potentially confusing is that Mary, uh, her dad filled this out because his signature is on the census. So her dad, in the first column over here, he actually wrote that she was under one. And then it looks like he crossed it out. And I can see why, because this column was actually for males, and this column was for the ages of females. So then he wrote over here under one, and it looks like under one month. And so I'm guessing probably she was born. The, the 1911 census was taken on April 2nd of 1911, so we would expect Mary to be born in, the, in probably in March of 1911, if this is correct. So, what records, given all that information we looked at, and the time period and the place, what records would have Annie's maiden surname? Well, from the easiest to maybe the, the least easy, there are three records that I would uh, expect, where I'd expect to find this information. First of all, I would expect it to be on their daughter Mary's birth registration, because English birth registrations always list the mother's maiden name. Well, almost always. If it's left off, it's generally a mistake, or the it's a child born out of wedlock. But in that case, even if the mother's maiden name isn't, explicitly written, you can tell it from the name of the mother. The next record I would start with or would go to would be the marriage. So with the uh, surname, the maiden surname that we've gotten from the child's birth registration, we could look for a marriage to William Gordon Groves with that same surname for Annie Maud. And then the last place that would give us some validation or verification would be the census before she got married. So if we can find an Annie Maud with a surname that matches the surname on the registration and the marriage, then we would be confident that we've found the right maiden surname. Two little caveats. You have to be careful on marriages because women didn't always marry under their maiden name. For instance, in countries where women change their name upon marriage, if a woman married and changed her name and then her husband died and then she remarried, she most likely got married under the name that she used as a surname in her first marriage. So just because we find a record with a woman's, a woman's surname on it doesn't guarantee that that was her maiden surname. A lot of the time it is, but you have to be careful there. And then also, 
Uh, for the census, if we don't know the maiden name already, it's kind of difficult to search for the person. About the only time that works is if the first name is extremely unique and the parish or the town is very, very small so that you are you have a very good chance of finding somebody without a last name. But most of the time, we're, want, we're going to want to establish or at least have a good theory about the last name before we try to find the person in the census before marriage. So let's take a look at the daughter Mary's birth registration. Based on the census, we think she's probably born 1911, but possibly 1910, a little bit of ambiguity there. And then also based on her birthplace, which was Biker, Northumberland, we would expect her to be registered in the Newcastle upon Tyne registration district. How did I know that? I googled. That's, um, and there is a huge PDF document that you can find by googling that will give you all the registration districts in England. So with this information, we go to the General Register Office site and we look for Mary's birth registration and this is what we find. So we find a Mary Groves and her mother's maiden name is Richardson. So now we have a good working theory that Annie Mont's maiden name is Richardson. But look what else, you guys. Her birth registration is 1910. So the first thing I wondered, okay, there was a little bit of ambiguity on that 1911 census, but another possibility is that they had a daughter named Mary in 1910 who died, and then they had another daughter that they gave the same name to who was born in 1911. So while I'm not going to show screenshots of, the, of my search, I did do a very careful search to make sure that there wasn't another Mary Groves, that this first one didn't die and there wasn't another one. And I found absolutely no record of another Mary Groves. So this is actually potentially a good example of what we talked about before, that sometimes people just unintentionally make mistakes on records. But we don't want to just assume that, we want to get some proof. So I did want to point that out. Sometimes when you're doing research, you come across these anomalies, and it's a good idea to do the best that you can to resolve them. So in the meantime, before we try to resolve that anomaly, we're going to look for a marriage for William and Annie. And we would expect it to be for a William Gordon Groves and an Annie Maud Richardson. And based on the census, they were married about 1910. We think they were married about one year. And sorry, I got that backwards. So these are the full names of the people that we're looking for. And so in this case, because marriage records are not searchable, on the General Register Office site where I found the birth registration, I went out to a site that you may recognize from the way it looks. It's called Free BMD for Birth, Marriage, Death. And it's a site where you can look up English civil registration for free. And look what happens when we look for marriages in 1910 in the Newcastle upon Tyne registration district. We've basically got a perfect match, William Gordon Groves and Annie Maud Richardson. Those names are unusual enough that I feel very confident that we found the marriage registration. If it was, you know, John Smith and Jane Jones or something like that, I would want to get more proof. But because these names are, are relatively unique, I'm pretty comfortable and because it lines up with the sense of location. So now we are pretty comfortable that Annie Maud's maiden name is Richardson. And now, because we have a theory about Richardson, we could try to find her in the census before she got married. And lo and behold, there is an Annie M. Richardson, born about 1892. It's a little off of what we were expecting. But again, census years, census birth years are estimated from the person's age in the census. Depending on where the age fell in relation to, or excuse me, depending on when the birth date happened in relation to when the census was taken, you can get variations of a couple of years in the estimated birth year. The other thing that clinches it for me is that she's, well, somebody misindexed this, bless their hearts, and it uh, they said Heston, but if you look at the image, it really is Heaton. So in addition to the name being correct, 
the approximate year being right. Uh, the birthplace is also right, Heaton, Northumberland. And she's also living in Biker now, where their first child was born. So everything's fitting together. And I feel really confident that Annie Maud's maiden name is Richardson. So now let's go back to the little bit of proof that we want to get that there really wasn't another Mary Groves. So for those of you who are familiar with the 1939 register in England, you know that it gives exact birth dates. So I was able to find the family in the 1939 register. And you notice that the dad is William G. Groves, the mom, Annie M. Groves, and there's Mary with them. Everything's lining up. The approximate birth years, or rather these exact birth years, match up with the approximate birth years. And here, Mary has given her exact birth date, which is in 1910. So that's more good proof that Mary, for whatever reason, when William was filling out the 1911 census, he wrote one month and he must have just meant to write one. And for whatever reason, he, he made that mistake. The other thing that we can do, oh, let me back up a second. If you've listened to our webinar on the 1939 register, you know that for many years, when a woman married, her married name was recorded right on the register. So Mary's married name here is Hudson. So we know that later, after 1939, she eventually married a man named Hudson. And so we look for her death registration, and she actually didn't die that long ago. In just in 1992, she's under Mary Hudson, and look at the birth date that they gave. So it's the exact right birth date. So now I'm comfortable that her birth date really was in 1910, and that's, you know, her dad just for whatever reason wrote it down wrong, but all the other records give us the correct date. And so sometimes you're going to run into this with multiple records. You'll, everything will say one thing except there will be one exception. And in that case, normally it's, it's a best practice or it's good advice to use the information that is most frequently given because most of the time that will be the right information. Okay, so you may have been asking yourself, some of you are probably familiar with English research, and so all those records that we talked about sounded very familiar, but other people listening to the webinar will say, good grief, how did you even know to check in those records? This is completely unfamiliar to me. So let's take a look at one of the best ways to find out what records you can search in for a specific time and place. And that is the amazing Family Search Research Wiki. I love this tool. It is seriously one of the most helpful tools if you want to know what records are available in a certain place and a certain time. So the way you get to it is to go to pretty much any, any Family Search page, click on this search option in the top menu, and you will see an, an option for the research wiki. You just go ahead and click that, and you get taken to the research wiki homepage, which has an area where you can search by place or topic. For this example, I'm going to search for Warwickshire, England. So I just type that in the search box, and then I either hit enter or click search. And when I do that, I get taken to a page, or you may get a page of search results too. It kind of depends on what they find for you. But you'll either go straight to the page, or you will go to a, a, a list of search results, and you can click the link to go to the page. But look at this amazing page for Warwickshire. They have got the records categorized by the type of record, and then they've got links to everything, including whether it's something that you might have to pay for if you need a, a subscription for it. There will be a little dollar sign here. So all these records are just right here, links to them. So easy to just come to the wiki, find out what's available, and click on it and go straight there and do whatever searches that you need to do. The other thing I wanted to mention is the more you get familiar with researching in a certain time and place, the more you'll be comfortable with, oh yeah, in the 1800s, uh, it's going to be church records. It's going to be civil registration in England. Uh, I, I should have said in England. So in the 1800s, uh, your church records, your civil registration, and your censuses, and of course, civil registration there 
would become available after mid 1837. The first pretty much the first useful census is 1841 because that's when they started listing everybody in the household. So it, my point is that you'll get familiar with the, the main characteristics and the most helpful records that are available in the place and time period that you're searching in. So between your experience and between the wiki, you'll be able to find the records that you're looking for in, in most cases. So that actually brings us to the end of our webinar today. We talked about why one record is rarely enough because records really focus on most of the time just one event in a person's life and they don't include information about other events and sometimes records can be inconsistent or inaccurate. We gave a, an example of proving Martin's death date so that we had a more complete and accurate picture of his life. We went through the exercise of finding Annie Maud's maiden name and on the way proving her daughter's birth year. And then we also talked about how to know what records to check. So thank you everybody so much for joining us today. And Bryant, do we have any questions? Thanks, Catherine. Um... Yeah, we'll now open it up uh, to any questions that the audience might have for Catherine. So if you have any questions, please post it in the chat box and uh, Catherine can answer them for us. It looks like our first question is from Lee and it says, any resources besides the Family Search Research Wiki to find record hints? Oh, that's a great question. And can you hear me? Because I noticed I was muted momentarily. Okay, great. So on uh, other resources, probably the best one, and I'm so glad, Lee, that you asked this question, is when you're on the person's page in Family Tree, over on the right-hand side, very often you'll see record hints for that person. So great question. And also, to answer Robin's question about the handout, Robin, I stopped doing handouts actually because they get out of date so quickly and people lose them and so forth. And so this link right here on the, the final slide, if you click that, you'll be able to go to a place where the presentation itself is posted. Well, actually, I take that back. This one isn't there yet, but I'll add it after this webinar. But you, any of the presentations there, you can just click on the link and it opens it up in Google Slides, and then you can make a copy of it if you like, either by taking screenshots or saving the whole presentation. So thank you for asking that. Oh, I'd be happy to. Okay, what is a Mowbray template? That is actually the name that Slides Carnival has given to this template. I love Slides Carnival. If you are a presenter of any kind, if you give, you know, if you use any kind of slide presentations in a teaching, uh, teaching live classroom or giving webinars or whatever, this Slides Carnival site, and this is a live link actually, If you, so if you presentation you can click on it or you can just google slides carnival and they have dozens and dozens of absolutely free slide templates for powerpoint for google slides and for canvas for any of you who may teach in the educational the public educational system and so uh, if you want to take a look at those templates, just go on out to Slides Carnival. They're totally free and they do appreciate a credit, which is why I included it here. But you'll find that every template has a name. And so that kind of makes it easy to find a, a specific template if you're looking for it. Thank you for asking. Oh, and if I didn't explain that well enough, the template is basically the design of the slides. So it's the blue background, it's the colors of the fonts, it's this little kind of tile-ish uh, graphic off to the right-hand side. So. Thanks, Catherine. Um, if there's no more questions, then that will be the end of the webinar for today. We'd just like to remind everyone about our upcoming webinar uh, on the 18th, and that is Wednesday next week um, with Sarah Cochran, as well as on the 20th, and that's a Friday, um, Friday next week. 
And we hope to see you there. Hope you join us for those webinars. And as always, if you have any questions, please email us. I'm at FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu. Uh, we hope everyone has a great day and thanks for joining us.